the death that some believe isn't what police say it is. Both of those cases, uh, I completely understand why the families feel the way that they do. I may feel the same way if it involves somebody that, that was in my family. Police initially reported her death to KOCO as a homicide, but her boyfriend told investigators she used a shotgun to kill herself. Police provided KOCO this brief report, but have denied a request for a copy of the 911 call. We also requested an autopsy report. The state medical examiner has not replied. After she died, her sister and some other relatives started examining her social media accounts. I mean, he was stalking her. He kept accusing her of, of cheating on him. His behavior after her death made them suspicious that he had something to do with it. And some of the grisly details that he reported without any emotion in his voice. So the moms noticed there were similarities, not only in the ways that their daughter had died, he had been with each woman three years apart for two months before she had died. He had showed up at each of their workplaces and made you know some friends and family uncomfortable. Constantly asked about each of their whereabouts. Each woman, the moms thought uh, their daughters were about to break up with him. He had attempted to isolate each woman from friends and families in the view of the family um, before each woman had died. He's up to something, but we we don't have the evidence to prove that he that he did it. Today, I want to talk about the Holly Schustrom and Sandra Stevens case. This case is really weird because the circumstances seem so obviously that of foul play to most people, but the cases have been ruled as unaliving, if you know what I mean. Holly and Sandra, they both dated the same guy three years apart. They both end up dead when they're with him and they died the same way. And then there are all these things leading up to that where people were saying that he was controlling and jealous and stalking them and they were fighting and they were trying to break up with him and they end up dead with him the same way. And police don't seem to think he had anything to do with it. Holly and Sandra's family, they think that this boyfriend did this to them. And the reason why I'm going to keep saying this boyfriend, this boyfriend is because um, his name has not been released. His identity has been protected because he hasn't been accused of a crime. And that's another part of the, the conspiracy theories as to why people think he, quote unquote, allegedly, my conspiracy, got away with it. So I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I'm going to give you guys the facts, okay? And then we'll discuss the theories, and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing starts in Oklahoma City in 2011, okay? The, the boyfriend, he is an Army combat veteran, and he meets this girl. Her name is Holly Schustrom. Holly was a 22-year-old single mom. She had struggled with an addiction to pills like painkillers but she had gone through treatment. She had like a baptism. She was sort of starting over. She got her life back on track. She had a job at like this local diner. She was living with her mom and her sister and her son. She was taking care of her son, going to work and had really high hopes for the future. And it seemed like that addiction was behind her. So she meets this guy. She meets him and they start dating. And at first it seemed like things were fine until people started noticing that he was very jealous and controlling. He would show up unannounced at her job. He was always accusing her of cheating. He was tracking her location. He was checking her social media, making sure she wasn't talking to anyone. And it started to become kind of an issue. According to Holly's family, she was planning on leaving him. She just couldn't take that the jealousy and the way he was so controlling and she was going to break up with him. But instead, she ends up dead. It was May 21st, 2011, two months after they had started dating. And Holly was at the home that she shared with her mom and sister with her boyfriend and they were alone. All of a sudden, her boyfriend calls 911 and tells them that Holly shot herself. He tells the police that Holly was uh, an addict and she was depressed and that at the time she was on drugs and out of her mind. Holly's mom, Colleen, she wasn't at home, she was out. So when Colleen talks to the boyfriend, he tells her that Holly was in the backyard smoking a cigarette 
And that was the last thing he knew. And then all of a sudden he heard gunshots and went outside and noticed that she was dead. When Colleen comes home, she notices some things that are inconsistent with what Holly's boyfriend told her. First of all, she notices that there seems to be blood spatter in the living room, not in the backyard where supposedly she shot herself. Then she sees like a cleaning product out on the bathroom sink. And she immediately is thinking, wait a minute, did this happen in the living room? And then he cleaned it up or did it happen in the backyard? As he said, then he told her that she was in the backyard smoking a cigarette when she shot herself. But then when she went into Holly's bedroom, Holly's cigarettes and lighter were in the bedroom. And she notices that Holly's cell phone is there. So she takes Holly's cell phone. She goes into her phone and she notices that there's a bunch of text messages from the boyfriend to Holly that she describes as abusive. Then Holly's boyfriend calls Colleen and tells her, I want to come over and grab some of my things that I left over there. And she says, okay, so he comes over and according to Colleen, she had Holly's phone on the charger in the living room. The boyfriend came in, did his thing. She was in another room. When he left, she went back to look at the phone and noticed that all those messages between Holly and the boyfriend were deleted. So she freaks out. She goes to police. She tells them everything and they end up bringing him in for questioning. When they bring him in for questioning, he denies everything. He's like, no, I didn't delete the messages. Um, he tells them the same story. He's like, listen, she had this addiction problem. She was unstable and she, this is what happened. So police end up being like, okay. The other weird thing is according to the injury that Holly had from the gunshot wound, it appears as though the gun was a foot away from her head. This is very unusual in cases where someone has taken their own life with a gun because they usually um, are very close if not touching the skin. The farther away it is, the less likely it is that someone did this to themselves. The further out that that gun is from the wound, the less likely someone could have done that to themselves. So when you have any kind of a distance in, in a gunshot wound, you start becoming a little more suspicious as, you know, as it goes. And in Holly's case, it was about a foot away, the gun from her head. Despite all of that, police believe the boyfriend. They rule it as, you know, an unaliving, if you will. And that's it. Case closed. And then three years later, it happens again. So this time it's 2014, we're still in Oklahoma City, and Sandra Stevens, she is 21, so very close in age to Holly. And she ends up meeting this same guy, the boyfriend, at a party. They hit it off and they start dating. Now, Sandra, she worked at a restaurant. She had just finished cosmetology school. Her life was great. She lived with her parents. And Everything seemed good. She didn't have a history of depression or anything like that. A month after dating this guy, Sandra decides to move in with him. And her family, at first, they were like, this is weird. Like, it's too soon. We don't think you should move in with him. And she was talking about moving out. And I said, well, I think it's too soon. You don't know him well enough. But she was in love with him. She decided she's going to move in with him anyway. A month after that, she ends up dead. Just like with Holly... They were two months into dating when they ended up dead. And guess what? Just like with Holly, the same situation was happening where he was being jealous, controlling, tracking her location with GPS, questioning her, accusing her of cheating, popping up at the job, all the same stuff. Just to give you an idea, I want to read you some of the messages that were discovered on Sandra's Facebook after the fact. This particular message is from when she told him that she gave a male coworker a ride home and he was really mad about it. He said, me and you are about to have an effing problem. Guess you didn't learn your lesson last time. I'll be sure to step it up a notch, okay? And then there are other messages I wanna read you. So he says, why does the GPS on here always say you're next door? 
And she says, I don't know. On mine, it says I'm home. And then he shows a screenshot of him tracking her. And he says, the star is your house. She says, yeah, that's my address. He says, the red dot is current location. She says, because my room is on that side of the house, LOL. And then he says, hmm, LOL. And then she says, that's really weird. Do you think I'm not at home, baby? And then he says, no, I'm not saying that, LOL. Just telling you what it said, sweetie. Don't worry. Never thought that. She goes, okay, good. I'm getting really tired. This is another message. He says, I guess you had a guilty conscience last night. And she says, so then why do you get jealous more than me? He says, because your actions are obvious and all you do is stutter when I ask. Yeah, no answer. She says, and if I had one, you wouldn't believe it. And then it seems like she called him and he didn't answer. And then he says, your actions have said plenty. She says, I'm sure they did. I'll get the rest of my stuff tomorrow. He says, I'll drop it first thing. I'll drop it off first thing in the morning, bagging it up now. She says, my deodorant is in the bathroom. He says, now you're home. Guess GPS works after all. And always when you get done texting, always. She says, I'm getting in the shower now. I'll text you when I'm out. He says, yeah, funny how your GPS mysteriously turned off again. Funny. You really think I'm a dumbass, huh? Yeah, and now no answer. Here we go again. She says, I'm at home, just got out of the shower, exclamation point. I told you earlier that I was going to go home to get ready for tonight. Now, since we aren't going out, can I still somewhat, can I still get somewhat dressed up? Do I have to ask? And then he says, is your mom even home? No, not at all. So why did you turn your GPS off again? That's no accident. She said, I didn't notice I did. He's like, bullshit. And then she says, I really didn't. So that's just to give you an idea of the communication that they had. And then Sandra's coworker says that they noticed that he would be there, he would pop up and that he would make her take out her like checkout slips to prove what time she actually left work. And they knew all of that. And so it had gotten to the point where Sandra was pretty much done. And she went to her parents and she told them, you know, this is what's going on. I don't want to be with him anymore. And they say that they told her, good, like leave him and come be with us. And that she went home, like to the place she shared with her boyfriend and that she was packing her stuff to leave him. But instead she ended up dead that night. And that actually when they went there, they noticed that she had her clothes packed up, ready to go. She came home to, uh, to tell us that uh, she was um, um, that she had problems with him, that he was always questioning her, where was she going, that uh, he didn't trust her because he was accusing her that she had somebody else or she was cheating on him, and she never made it. She, I mean, we found her clothes packed, so she was uh, ready to come. So this is what happened. So Sandra and her boyfriend, they lived in a home with three other roommates. One was a guy called Caleb. And then they also lived with another couple, Austin and Kaylee. Austin and Kaylee and Caleb, they say that they had only lived with Sandra and her boyfriend for about two weeks and that they kept to themselves and they really didn't interact with them a lot. The weird thing is, is this reporter, her name is Juliana. She works for the Oklahoman. She was really into this case and she started looking into it and she ended up getting access to the police files. And she says that one thing that stood out was the fact that Austin, one of the roommates, his account of what happened was not in the file, even though he spoke to police. So she ends up tracking him down, talking to him and asking him what happened. And this is what he says. Austin says that he hung out with Sandra that night, hours before she died. He said that she wasn't upset, but that it was clear that she was fighting with her boyfriend, but he said that it, he wasn't sure they had even broken up yet at this point, but there, there was some sort of issue there, but she wasn't like super, super upset. But then Austin said something that contradicted what Sandra's parents said, because Sandra's parents said she came over, she told them about the situation, and they told her, leave him and come stay with us, like you're always welcome. My husband said, well, if he can't trust you, there's no way you can keep this relationship. Okay, 
you need to end it. And this is your house. This is your home. You can come back home and we love you unconditionally. But Austin says that Sandra left and when she came back, she was really upset because she said that she went to her parents and they basically were not going to take her in and she felt like she didn't have anywhere to go. And he said that's when he noticed that she got really upset. And so that is the first thing where it's kind of like, what what really happened there? What happened next was that um, they apparently all went to bed. And so Austin and his girlfriend, Kaylee, their room is right next to Sandra and her boyfriend's room. And Austin says he remembers at around 3 a.m. he heard a gunshot and he said he had a sinking feeling. He ran out into the hallway where he saw Caleb and Sandra's boyfriend talking. Sandra's boyfriend was wondering basically if it would look suspicious to police that the shotgun was his. And then he explains to Austin that Sandra basically shot herself with his shotgun. So Austin says the first question that came out of his mouth was, well, where were you? And he says he remembers very, very specifically that the boyfriend told him that he was in the garage smoking a cigarette when he heard the gunshot and then he ran into the bedroom and that's when he found Sandra dead with the, his shotgun next to her. Austin's girlfriend, Kaylee, she said that she actually slept through the shooting and that she woke up later with all the commotion was going on. And she was interviewed and she basically, when she was asked, like, do you think Sandra did this to herself? She didn't exactly just say yes. I just couldn't believe it. She says the couple was fighting shortly before the incident. Do you believe that she took her own life? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, yeah. The next thing that happens is at around 5 a.m., the boyfriend calls 911. The boyfriend tells the 911 dispatcher that my girlfriend shot herself. He also mentions in that call that a previous girlfriend of his which is Holly, that she also shot herself and that he also called 911. And he mentions that this is like the second time pretty much the exact same thing has happened. So police show up to the scene and at first they actually thought it was a homicide. So they start questioning everyone in the home. The boyfriend tells them that a couple of days before this, Sandra was depressed, that she locked herself in the bathroom, that she cut herself, and that she was on drugs, and that they had gotten into a fight because he accused her of cheating on him, and that he left the bedroom, went to sleep on the couch in the living room, and then at 3 a.m. heard a gunshot, ran into the bedroom, and that's where he found Sandra dead. Okay, so very similar story as to what happened to Holly. Uh, but the difference here is that he told Austin that he was in the garage when it happened, but now he's telling police that he was in the living room. Another weird thing here is that Austin, he says that he immediately was suspicious of the boyfriend, but he didn't say anything to police. He said that when police asked him what happened, he claims he told them that it was the garage, that that's what the boyfriend told him. But he didn't say, I'm suspicious of him. I think he did it. And then when asked about, you know, were there any issues of like domestic violence or anything like that? He said, no, he didn't see anything like that. The other roommates all said the same thing. And based on the fact that police did not see any evidence that she was sort of abused and everyone denied it. And that was kind of the story. They changed their initial impression of the situation from homicide. And just like with Holly's situation, they said that Sandra did this to herself. Although none of the roommates told police that they suspected the boyfriend, they end up kicking him out of that home right after this happened. So they weren't comfortable with the situation at the very least. And when the reporter asked Austin, like, what do you think happened? He's like, I don't know. I don't know if he bullied her into doing this or if he did it himself. He also thinks it's really 
bizarre that this happened to two of his girlfriends in the same exact way when Sandra's family found out that this happened and that the police were saying that she did this to herself, they did not believe it. That was kind of not possible because she never held a gun in her whole life. One of the things that made Sandra's mom immediately suspect the boyfriend, other than the fact that Sandra had told her that he's controlling and jealous and everything, is that she called him right after and she said, I want to come and like see the situation and everything like once she was notified and she says that he was very cold and graphic in the way that he spoke to her about what happened to Sandra. And I said, I want to go see her. Where is she? And she said, oh no, you don't want to come and see her. She blew her head and her brain is all over my bedroom. I mean, who tells a mother that, even though that, if that happened? I mean, just cold. Sandra's family were like, dude, there's no way she did this to herself. First of all, she wasn't depressed. She had been through worse breakups with people that she'd been with way longer and never was this upset about it. Um, plus she was trying to leave him because of that. And so everybody knows, well, I don't know if everybody knows, but it's, it's well known or it's been established that in domestic violence situations, the most dangerous time for the victim is when they are trying to leave. And so it's funny how there's all these similarities between what happened to Holly and what happened to Sandra. But keep in mind, at this moment, Sandra's family have no idea about Holly, the other girlfriend, and what happened to her. They don't know. At this point, they are asking for an autopsy and toxicology, and they want like an independent one. And so they get all that, and they don't find evidence that she was all on drugs, like he said. They don't find evidence of self-harm on her body in terms of evidence on the boyfriend they didn't do like a gunshot residue thing he did have some blood on his ha arm his right hand i think but he said that he went to check for a pulse and that's how he got it and so the police were like okay that's what that is so because they couldn't really get anywhere with police in the investigation and the case was closed the family decides to make a facebook page and a gofundme and they had, their facebook page is called uh, justice for sandra stevens and it was then that Colleen, remember Colleen, Holly's mom, she ends up reaching out to them through the Facebook page and tells them, hey, the same exact thing happened to my daughter three years ago. This is when they make the connection. Phone calls were made and it all culminated into a meeting at the Stevens family kitchen table. Sylvia Stevens met Colleen Schustrom, who was Holly's mom and also suspected the boyfriend. Then that reporter, Juliana, that I told you about, she gets involved in the case and she starts digging, right? She found so much information that should have been found by police and sort of gaps in the investigation and things that people think were mishandled. So first of all, the 911 call, when he tells the 911 operator that this has happened before with another one of his girlfriends, the police did not think that that was relevant to the case they didn't look into that at all, and they also did not tell the medical examiner about that. When the medical examiner was determining manner of death, they didn't know about this. And according to experts, the medical examiner is supposed to also get contextual information, circumstantial evidence to get a full picture so that they can interpret the evidence that they're seeing the physical stuff more completely and accurately. And if they had known that the same exact thing happened to a previous person, they may have not put manner of death as suicide. Maybe they would have said unknown, M maybe not homicide, but maybe they would have said unknown. There could have been sort of a more critical look at the situation. Not only did they not tell the medical examiner about what was in the 911 call, but the police refused to release the 911 call to the public. But this reporter, Juliana, she did have access to it and the file, as I mentioned before. She listened to it and she says that he's very calm, and she says that he's very cold, very calm. She found out that his ex-wife, she actually accused him of beating her and she had photographs of this and she had told people about this. He had an ex-wife um, who accused him of beating her and she had visible signs of injury to her neck 
from an incident in Killeen, Texas in 2008. And then on top of that, she found that he had a, a criminal record that involved violence with other family members, not necessarily intimate partners, but also he was sort of violent with people close to him in his life. Then on top of that, which is even crazier, she found that at the same time that this boyfriend was accusing Sandra of cheating on him, he was also basically stalking and harassing his ex-girlfriend online to the point where three days after Sandra died, that ex-girlfriend filed a restraining order on him. Do we have a pattern here? You've got the ex-wife claiming he did that to her. Ex-girlfriend files a restraining order. He's harassing her. One girlfriend ends up shot dead. He's there. He calls 911. And then a couple years later, the same exact thing happens. In both situations, he's there with them. They were trying to leave him. They said he was jealous. They said he was controlling. It's for a lot of people, it's like, this is so clearly, obviously, what's going on. How come the police don't see it like that? This reporter, Juliana, with, with the Oklahoman, they've been doing like a two-year investigation on this case. She also was able to speak to the boyfriend. He didn't want to go on the record, but she talks about her conversation with the boyfriend. We did try to contact the boyfriend. We went to his last known address. Hey, this is Juliana Keeping. I'm a reporter with the Oklahoman. I'm calling because we're doing a story on Sandra Stevens. Uh, and I just wanted to see if you would participate in the story. I called him on his cell phone and we did reach him. He didn't want to come on camera, but he did say that um, he feels awful for the Stevens family. He, he didn't really know what to say because he didn't want to agitate the situation. But he did say it was unfortunate what they're doing, which is, you know, I guess just pushing the story forward and accusing him. After two years of investigating this case, they come out with this sort of series called Suspicious Suicides, where they talk about this case. This renews the pressure and public attention on the case, and the police end up reopening the case. They give it to a cold case detective that's part of the um, police. What the hell? What happened to me? I, what happened? And for a couple of months, you don't really hear about anything. And then all of a sudden they come out and they say, we looked into it again and we nothing's changed. They still did it to themselves and the case is now closed. Uh, we haven't found anything that would lead us to believe that, that they were murderers. They didn't explain why. They simply said, we looked into it, nothing changed, it's still the same. According to Holly and Sandra's parents, they were never contacted by this investigator, the cold case investigator, or the police at any time during any of this. I never heard from them again, ever. And of course, they were really disappointed. This case being reopened and closed, this happened in 2017. The family, they're, they're just like, we don't know what else to do. We've tried everything. You know, we want them to look into it, but th they did and nothing came of it. And like, we think he's going to do it again. At the moment, as of now, that's where the case stands, right? So those are the facts. Okay, now I want to talk about the theories because... There basically are two main theories here, which is, did these two girls do this to themselves, which is the official story, or did the boyfriend do this to them? So let's start with the official story. So first with Holly, the fact that she had this addiction issue before, and it's possible that she may have relapsed, and if she did relapse, could she have been under so much emotional distress from the way this guy was with her and they're fighting and her trying to break up with him that she ended up breaking and she took her own life? At least seem to think that's reasonable to assume. The thing is, they never did a toxicology or an autopsy. It's not very common with suicides to do that. They just kind of sort of say, okay, that's what happened and we're done. And so... We don't really know if she was on something or not, but even if she was, she had had this addiction before and never took her life then. It doesn't mean necessarily that if she was on something, she did it, right? The other thing that I think does not 
support the theory that she did this to herself is how far away the gun was. It was a foot away from her. So she would have had to hold it like really far like this and then aim it and then it hits. I mean, it just doesn't seem common. I mean, that one expert said that most of them are actually like it's touching the skin. So that right there is making me think, hmm, it seems like he couldn't take that she was going to leave him. And so he killed her. And then he got away with it. And so then the next time he got with a girlfriend and he couldn't take that she was going to leave him, he did it again. But remember, there's also that ex-girlfriend who filed the restraining order. She's still alive. I'm not sure if she was before Holly or in between Holly and Sandra. But again, she ends up getting a restraining order on him because he won't stop harassing her. So clearly, at the very little least, right, this guy is touched, unhinged. We're going to look at the official theory with Sandra. The one thing that I think may support that theory is what Austin said about her coming back from her parents' home and they them telling her, we don't want you back, and she felt like she had nowhere to go. Could she have spiraled because of that? But then... Austin also said that the boyfriend was inconsistent with his stories and he said he was in the garage and then he told the police he was in the living room. What did he forget such a huge momentous occasion where he was or was he lying? Did he get confused and mess up his story because it was all made up? I don't know. The other theory, which is that the boyfriend did this to them, there seems to be a lot more evidence supporting that, at least in my opinion, right? This is my theory, allegedly, allegedly, don't sue me. First thing is credibility factor, right? If this guy is, you know, a veteran, could he have had more of a rapport with the police officers? Is that a thing? Number one. Number two, the fact that these girls, he's saying they're on drugs and they're emotionally unstable and they're depressed, could that have affected the way that police viewed them from the beginning? Also, they couldn't find any evidence of this domestic situation, but they didn't even look into it. It seems like they just wanted to believe him at face value and write it off. But there's all this evidence of him being controlling, violent, obsessive, stalking, and what are the odds that two of your girlfriends kill themselves in front of you with with you with gun in the, after they're trying to leave you and you've been stalking and, and harassing them and, and they want like what are the odds of that? To me, slim to none. What are the odds of a guy killing both of his girlfriends, coming up with the same story twice and getting away with it because he got away with it the first time and then getting away with it again because police officers just believed him? That kind of seems more likely to me my opinion allegedly don't sue me. I don't know who this guy is, but clearly they find him very credible. And, you know, so it's all alleged. I don't know. Don't kill me and say I did it to myself. I will never kill myself for the record. But I'm just saying I'm scared. I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Tell me. I would love to know. And I don't know if this case will get opened again. I really hope it does. I feel like they need to look into what the, the Oklahoman, the reporter, Juliana, what she found, talk to the ex-wife release the 911 call, go through the messages. You know, these are the things that really need to be looked into to say once and for all, in my opinion, if this, if this really happened or not. But anyway, let me know what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.